one of the questions in the final volume is, okay, if we define the if we are defining that the values are represented at the centroids of the subsequent cells, and we need to cal calculate, for example, the the diffusive fluxes, or in, in many situations, we need to have the gradients to, to calculate some functions here inside the cells. Like, like imagine you're dealing with a fluid flow problem. You might need to calculate the strain tensor to, for example, for blood flow simulation, calculate the viscosity. Uh, in generally, in, um, in turbulent simulations, many, many, well, actually all turbulent models, they, um, they calculate the production of kinetic turbulent energy based on the um, shear stress tensor. So you need to have gradients inside of the cells to compute other things. But also, you could, you could ask the question, do you need to make this approximation of like uh, neighbor minus my value divided by the distance that it's really the proper gradient calculation, whereas it really isn't proper gradient formulation if, the, um, if um, these two things are not perpendi perpendicular to each other. So you might ask the question how to better calculate the gradient. And there are two ways in fine volumes, or probably more ways to do that, but two popular ways um, how people compute gradients. One of them is the Gauss procedure. The other one is, does anyone know? I remember the in the flow and there are two four men <laughs> Yeah, there are influences. <laughs> <with Gauss and. laughs> And the other one was well, maybe self-centered. Uh, no. So Gauss and not Gauss. Uh, the not Gauss is least squares formulation. Oh, yeah. uh, what is each of them? The first one. Um, applies the Gauss theorem, so basically a very simple observation that if you write the integral of the domain of the cell um, from the gradient of some quantity, let it be, let it be P, whatever it is, not necessarily pressure, times D omega, it can be calculated as the integral of something like something like that. Well, obviously, this one in fine volume discretization is nothing else as the mean gradient at the cell, average gradient times V. This one is obviously sum of all faces, P at the face, times and the phase times IF. Once you've computed the solution and you know how to interpolate between two neighboring cells, you can already calculate that, divide by the volume of the cell, and you've got vector representation of the gradient of some quantity. Okay? That's the first way. The least squares uh, procedure, what would it be? For the least squares proce procedure, we need, to, we need to use the uh, directional derivative. So basically, we need to remember that you can represent you at the neighboring at the neighboring cell by saying, okay, that's my value plus gradient of u at my location times 
the vector connecting well me with the with the neighboring cell. Okay, let the, this be the vector pointing from my location to the specific neighbor. Well, you, you'd need to expand this plus one half, like the, oh, well, the, how would it be? We need to take the second derivatives. Uh, so there's a lot of tensor notation. However, it's approximation, okay? And now see what we have got. In two dimensions, we've got the gradient uh, with two components, d u d x, d u d u d y. Uh, you've got this tensor with is vector with two components, uh, but in two D you have at least three neighbors, right? at least three neighbors. You've got four neighbors for the quad cells. So, uh, you can't re so you can write three equations like that, and you can't fulfill all the equations. So what you're doing is you're writing these three equations and solving them in the least squares sense. Uh, and by doing so, you end up having two components of the gradient that ap approximate the the variation of the spatial field as good as they can. It's also a commonly used approach, a bit more uh, computationally expensive, like because this one can be calculated explicitly, this one needs, uh, needs solution of a small linear system in the least square sense. The good question is, can you discretize it for, for implicit procedures? Well, probably, maybe you can, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I think like for, if it's a small system of equation, it's quite easy to uh, derive the uh, inverse matrix for this problem, which is constant and yeah, I'm not going to do that, but I think you, you should be able for a small linear system, well, like, like the least squares formulation requires you to minimize a quadratic optimization problem, uh, but then you're uh, calculating the derivatives, which leads you to the linear problem. And for a small system, whatever you do, whether you calculate the determinants, whether you, you, know, you try to do well, Gaussian elimination uh, on a small on a small linear system, or whether you calculate the inverse matrix, uh, you should be able to do it analytically. And for two D, it will be matrix Q two, so like calculating inverse, and even for three D, it's three or three. Yeah, it's also quite simple. Yes, exactly. You would end up with a two by two or a three by three matrix, uh, so you can probably calculate the inverse analytically and implement the analytical uh, formula, which means if you can come up with the analytical formula, this means that you can also use the least squares um, gradient reconstruction into the implicit formulation of the, of the fine volume method. Pro probably a bit of maths on the on the sheet of does paper before you start those, implementation. Hmm? Does any of those method has advantages over the other, or like in the accuracy sense? I don't know. I have never gone so deeply into uh, investigating the order or the error of the method. Like I did, I did implement well, many years ago, the least squares procedure for fine volume method and gradient uh, computation, but in an explicit solver. So we've been, we've been solving the um, transport equation explicitly, simply time-stepping, 
and then we were interested in the gradients, and that's how we've been computing them. But I have never, com I have never implemented it uh, in an implicit procedure to investigate the order or accuracy of the method. Questions? Maybe one last comment. I'm not going to, to cover this algorithm right now, but we, we said yesterday that the, in the application of the upwind scheme uh, means that you're down to the first order of the method. Uh, that doesn't need to be the case always. Like applying the upwind scheme in a, in a so naive way as we've been doing here, just taking the, the value from the neighboring cell, exactly means that, going down to the first order. But there are higher order upwind schemes uh, that, so that you can find in the literature. I'm not going to, to cut them. What they, are doing, what they are generally using is they might be using the, the values at my and neighboring cell, but also the gradients at the neighboring cells. Um, the, the other way would be to try to reach to the well, father neighbors. Uh, that's, that's actually the same, that's probably the analogy of having the finite difference method where you're interested in calculating the, the gradient at this location and see what we've been done when, when defining the, the upwind scheme is we've said, okay, we can't use the central differences. We need to use something that is upstream to the flow. So we are using this and that, which brings us down to the first order. But now remember the Taylor expansion series and how we've been defining the, the derivatives. We're interested in calculating this derivative. What we could do to, to be a bit smarter is, well, maybe let's exploit one more node that is upstream in the flow, so not using this one. And now, again, we've got, we've got one, two, three locations, three values. So going back to the Taylor expansion series, you've got already three values. So you can eliminate, like, you can eliminate the term with the function itself. You can require that the term with the first derivative is exactly one, as you wish. And you can require the second derivative with respect to x to vanish. So by doing something like that, you can come up with the higher order upwind scheme for the fine difference method, it's pretty easy. For the fine volume method, it's very, very problematic on unstructured meshes because it's, it's easy to, to reach the neighboring cell, but it's really extremely difficult to formulate uh, stand series that would span from this location to that and to the neighbors of the neighbors. So you usually don't do that. What you, what you usually do is you're using, the, you're using the, this value, that value, and the gradient of the function at the neighboring cell because it's much easier to use the gradient at the neighboring cell than to, to try to reach to the neighbors of the neighbors. Just the idea, but the for the fine volume method, if you're interested, just look in the literature for higher order, higher order upwind schemes. Yes, you've got the book there. Uh, one of them also exploited in Ansys Fluent is the quick scheme. Quadratic interpolation convective. I don't know. If you want, just check. Okay. Is this quick scheme like 
quick that does it have some advantages over the, for example, second order outlet? Because I, I've been using second, like first order and second order outlet for all the simulations, I think. <laughs> and like I have never used quick, quick uh, scheme. So uh, maybe I, I, I was missing some advantages of the quick. I think I think quick is second order, not necessarily higher. But uh, you know, in in Ansys fluent, you have uh, like the second order uplink and also quick. As ah, okay. So, uh, like the question is about advantages or differences between those two. If you know. don't know. Okay, I think uh, I would there, check like there are don't know. There is, you know, there is generally huge discussion, or there has been huge discussion just a couple of years ago in, in CFD. People, people got really very much keen on higher order schemes and higher order methods uh, generally. So there was uh, many, many scientific papers on defining higher order methods for, for fine volume method. Uh, like high order schemes for for fine volume method, uh, you might have heard about high order fine elements like for example spectral element methods. Um, this discussion is to some extent valid, but I I would say it's rather academic because it turns out that yes, it is important to have at least second order schemes because you you can get rid of the large portion of the discrepancy is coming from the numerical diffusion, and that's important, especially for turbulent simulations, especially for LES simulations, where you want to keep the, the, um, the diffusivity, the viscosity in the CFD solution as close to the physical viscosity as you, as you want, uh, as you should. Uh, but in industrial applications, it turns out that, you know, if you've got the third or fourth order scheme and you can even implement that, then it turns out that in industrial applications you've got so many uh, details in the mesh and in the geometry that you need to, to handle higher order meshes geometrically, higher order, which means representing the, the curved, curved boundaries. Uh, and very often you've got so many, so many details that, well, having more unknowns in the higher order elements is the trade-off so big that well, it's probably enough having second order method and higher number of elements in the mesh. This quadratic upstream interpolation from the vector kinematics and what it does, it uh, uses all of the flexes and constructs a quadratic function which is biased towards the upwind. Uh, okay. 